This is part two of the lecture for the Delaware OBGYN resident lecture series in which we review the practice advisory about Zika and pregnancy. The two updated portions that came out in April 2017 are travel restrictions, which we discussed in the last lecture, and testing, which we will discuss today. We're just going to talk about things about Zika that have a bearing on the interpretation of lab results. Zika is a flavivirus closely related to dengue, West Nile, Japanese encephalitic, and yellow fever viruses. This similarity needs to be kept in mind as we go along. All right, let's discuss the timeline for Zika infection and how that translates to diagnostic lab tests. The virus is introduced at the time of the bite. Wait, if the mosquito is taking blood, how does the virus get in? Well, the proboscis of the mosquito is more complicated than just a hypodermic needle. The hypopharynx injects saliva and the labrum pulls out blood. The mosquito saliva contains anticoagulants, vasodilators, and anesthetic, all to facilitate the blood draw before being smushed. The saliva is the stuff that elicits the immune response and the itching. It is also the stuff that happens to contain the virus. After injection comes the incubation period, the interval before the symptoms show up. The incubation period is about a week. As scientists, you know there's always a range, and a study showed 50% of people had detectable virus at one week and 99% at two weeks. I will generalize because it is easier to remember. The incubation period is about one week, and right around that time, there is a viremia, and the viremia is gone about a week after the illness. The symptoms of Zika illness are primarily fever, rash, conjunctivitis, and muscle pain or joint pain, particularly of the small joints of the hands and feet. The symptoms can be mild enough that the illnesses go unrecognized. In fact, 80% go unrecognized. IgM antibodies develop during the first week of the illness. Shortly thereafter, neutralizing IgG antibodies appear and remain for years. The persistence of IgM antibodies is variable, but are usually present from 2 to 12 weeks after the illness. Currently, there is no reliable method for the determination of IgG. Interestingly, infection or vaccination with one flavivirus can cause a bump in titers of antibodies to other flavoviruses the patient may have been exposed to. For example, a person vaccinated against yellow fever can increase titers to yellow fever when infected with Zika. This can make it difficult to figure out which virus caused the recent infection. Additionally, the test for IgM is an ELISA test which has cross-reactivity with other flavoviruses. Here's the timeline. Exposure, or bite. Incubation of about a week. Symptoms. A viremia right around the illness and gone by two weeks. And the appearance of IgM about a week or so after the illness that persists about 12 weeks. The diagnostic tests fall into two categories, nucleic acid tests and serology tests. Nucleic acid tests look for Zika-specific RNA, so the actual virus. This is the real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction test. If this is positive, the virus is present and testing is done. The problem is, this viremia is relatively brief during the first two weeks, and a negative result doesn't rule out recent infection. The other group of tests, the serologic tests, look for the body's reaction to the virus, namely antibodies. Their strength is not their specificity, like the nucleic acid tests, it's their sensitivity. They are more sensitive because the window of positive IgM is much longer than the window of detectable virus. The trade-off is the lower specificity due to cross-reactivity with other flavoviruses. That's where the specific antibody test comes in, the Plaque Reduction Neutralization Test, or PRNT. If this is the first flavivirus infection for the person, the PRNT will tell you which one it is. 
If they've already been infected with others, those levels can bump and make the whole thing confusing. That's the background. First we'll talk about asymptomatic pregnant patients and then symptomatic ones. The asymptomatic patient is one that who either comes to you asking about a possible exposure or one from which you elicit that history because you know to ask if they traveled out of the country or to Florida or Texas at every prenatal visit. If they traveled to a known Zika area or had sex with someone who did and they didn't use a condom, that is a possible Zika exposure. Remember, going to Cancun is the same as having sex in Delaware with someone who went to Cancun from a Zika perspective. Next, try to ascertain the timing of exposure. If the exposure was less than two weeks ago, call the Delaware Department of Public Health or their corresponding organization in your locale. They will likely arrange for her to have blood and urine specimens collected to test with nucleic acid tests. That's the real-time reverse transcriptase PCR that detects viral RNA or the actual presence of the virus. If it is positive, you're done testing. If negative, it will likely be recommended that the patient return in the 2 to 12 week window for serologic testing for Zika and Dengue IgM. If positive or equivocal, it needs to be confirmed by another specific antibody test, the plaque reduction neutralization test. If negative for Zika, you're done. If positive, refer to maternal fetal medicine for counseling and surveillance for microcephaly. If the exposure was 2 to 12 weeks ago, the health department will likely start with IgM instead of a nucleic acid test since it is likely already negative. However, if the IgM is positive, the next step is the nucleic acid PCR since it might still be positive and that is confirmatory of the presence of that particular virus in this particular pregnancy. That nucleic acid test is helpful if positive, but if it is negative, you need to figure out whether the IgM was for Zika or for Dengue. That's where the plaque neutralization test comes in. That's the one that differentiates Dengue from Zika. After 12 weeks, both IgM and nucleic acid tests may be negative and therefore not be able to rule out infection. According to ACOG, SMFM, and CDC, for symptomatic and asymptomatic pregnant women who seek care greater than 12 weeks after symptom onset or possible Zika virus exposure, providers may consider IgM antibody. This part has, in our experience, been inconsistent, with testing sometimes not recommended because interpretation of the results after 12 weeks is difficult. It has been our experience that a patient who presents at 19 weeks with a possible exposure at 6 weeks is interested in knowing whether the IgM is positive or not. Since the practice advisory specifically states that the provider may consider IgM testing after 12 weeks, I would push for that. Okay, now how about symptomatic patients? Well, the CDC algorithm treats testing the same whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. The differences are in time since exposure. A prenatal ultrasound to evaluate for fetal abnormalities consistent with congenital Zika virus syndrome is recommended for all pregnant women tested for Zika, regardless of laboratory findings. Fetal abnormalities consistent with congenital Zika virus syndrome include microcephaly, intracranial calcifications, and brain and eye abnormalities. So anyone you think to test you should get an ultrasound. If the testing is negative and the ultrasound is normal, you're probably done. If the testing is negative and the ultrasound is abnormal, like microcephaly, IUGR, intracranial abnormalities, you should retest and re-ultrasound, probably serially. Discuss this with the health department representing the CDC, and postnatal testing may be suggested. Postnatal testing involves infant serum and urine testing as well as the placenta. The placenta testing requires pre-approval, so make sure this has been arranged before delivery. If the testing is negative, but the symptoms were suggestive of Zika infection, perform serial sonography and speak with the health department about postnatal testing. This is in no way comprehensive. 
Identifying those at high risk and testing them are both complex. Here's the summary. Test patients with possible exposure, definitely within 12 weeks of exposure, and probably after that if they're pregnant currently and they were pregnant at the time of exposure. Order an ultrasound for IUGR and anomalies on all of those patients. Refer to the CDC, ACOG, or SMFM websites and speak to the health department personally for anyone in question.